1865, James Clerk Maxwell wrote his famous or infamously mathematically difficult Maxwell's equations that were to transform our world. For example, when Einstein was asked if he stood on the shoulders of Newton, he replied, no, on the shoulders of Maxwell. But who is James Maxwell? Why are his equations important? And why did he write them in the first place? It all has to do with a famous scientist named Michael Faraday who had no math skills and a young Lord Kelvin of temperature fame who inspired them both. Ready for this story? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. Let's start with a little backstory. In 1845, a 21-year-old student named William Thompson, later knighted Lord Calvin, inspired the already famous 54-year-old Michael Faraday to conduct an experiment that found a link between electricity, magnetism, and light. The next year, Faraday postulated that maybe light was really vibrations of electric and or magnetic fields, although he called them electric and magnetic lines of force. This is a radical idea, and most legitimate scientists thought it was balderdash. To make matters worse, he had rapidly failing memory and was suffering from severe depression, probably from mercury poisoning. Also, many scientists at the time looked down on Faraday for his low-class background, as well as his lack of mathematical ability. Fast forward nine years to 1853. James Clerk Maxwell was a 23-year-old Scottish math and physics student at Cambridge, famous for his intelligence, wit, and late hours. Supposedly, when he heard there was a required 6 a.m. chapel meeting, he replied, I, I suppose I can stay up that late. 1853 was an important year for Maxwell because he moved into his own place, or as he put it, entered into the unholy state of bachelorhood and had more time to do independent research. He decided to attack electricity and asked his friend Thompson for advice on who to read, looking for, quote, any notions I could screw into my head. Maxwell specifically wanted to know if he should start with a mathematical scientist or start with Faraday, who never used math. Thompson, who was the same person who inspired Faraday earlier, advised Maxwell to start with Faraday. Maxwell read Faraday and surprisingly, thought that it was secretly mathematical. Moreover, Maxwell felt that he could convert Faraday's math into conventional math, which he promptly did. In 1855, Maxwell published on Faraday's lines of force. Faraday was impressed and wrote Maxwell a plea to quote, translate them out of their hieroglyphics, i.e. math, that we might work upon them by experiment. Meanwhile, Maxwell had become at age 25 a full professor at Marischal College in Aberdeen. To fit in with the older staff, he grew a big, bushy beard. He still didn't feel comfortable there, saying, quote, no jokes of any kind are understood here. I've not made a joke for two months, and if I feel one coming on, I shall bite my tongue. However, he did meet Catherine Dewar, the daughter of a local history professor. It was an instant match, and they were married in June of 1859. They never had any children, but were a little obsessed with their dog, Toby. Catherine was also a scientist. We don't know exactly how much she contributed to Maxwell's work, as a fire burned down many of their papers and biographers were hesitant to mention her contributions in that sexist society. We do know, however, that when someone asked James Maxwell for some data, he replied, quote, my better half, who did all the real work in kinetic theory, is at present engaged in other researches. When she is done, I will let you know her answer to your inquiry. The Maxwells then moved to London and James Maxwell became a professor at King's College. At this time, Maxwell and his wife did pioneering work on color, including a method for creating the first color photograph, molecular theory, dimensional analysis, and how gases flow. James Maxwell continued to research how to add conventional mathematics to Faraday's theory. He was particularly interested in Faraday's theory from 1846 that light was really a vibration of electric or magnetic fields. At this time, William Thompson told Maxwell to read two German physicists, Weber and Karl Roche, who had experimentally connected the units of electricity to the units of magnetism. Weber et al. experimentally determined a speed, which they labeled C, 
probably because they already had an A and a B in their paper. This speed turned out to be the speed of light. This is why the speed of light is labeled C and Einstein's famous E equals MC squared equation. Anyway, in 1865, Maxwell wrote a paper where he coined the term fields instead of Faraday's lines of force. Maxwell excitedly wrote a friend that, quote, till I'm convinced to the contrary, I hold my new paper to be great guns. And he was right. In this paper, Maxwell claimed that Weber's results are, quote, so nearly that of light that it seems we have a strong reason to conclude that light itself is an electromagnetic wave. To Maxwell, his paper with all of his equations were the same in substance as Faraday's ideas from 1846, except as Maxwell put it, in 1846, there was no data to calculate the velocity of propagation. Maxwell's equations were more than just an equation for light, however. They actually put all of electric and magnetic theory in one beautiful package, describing them all through the lens of interrelated electric and magnetic fields. For example, in 1820, a man named Orsted found that current or moving charges Will move a magnet. In Maxwell's equations, the moving charges create a moving electric field, which creates a magnetic field. In another example, Faraday found in 1831 that moving a magnet in a coil would create current in that coil, which is why Faraday came up with the idea of magnetic lines of force in the first place. Maxwell's equations describe how a changing magnetic field will create an electric field, which creates a current. It's hard to overestimate how important Maxwell's equations are to physicists. A hundred years after Maxwell, the famous physicist Richard Feynman poetically said, 10,000 years from now, the most significant event of the 19th century will be judged as Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electromagnetism. The American Civil War will pale into provincial insignificance in comparison. Although Maxwell's equations were heralded as genius by the late 1800s, at the time, they were mostly ignored. The theories were bizarre and the mathematics was truly arduous. In fact, the original form of Maxwell's equations had a whopping 20 interconnected equations. However, soon a group of young scientists calling themselves Maxwellians started to promote his theories and simplified it. In 1884, a Maxwellian named Oliver Heaviside used something he created called vector calculus to get the modern form of Maxwell's equations with just four interconnected equations. Back in the 1860s, Faraday was pleased with Maxwell's attention, but was getting more feeble and confused. He gave his last free Christmas lecture for kids in 1860, and his last experiment on the magnetic influence on the light produced by a glowing gas on March 12, 1862. By the way, Faraday's last experiment was unsuccessful. But many years later, a man named Peter Zeeman redid the experiment with more sensitive equipment and won a Nobel Prize for it in 1902. Faraday died on August 25, 1867, and as was his wish, had a plain, simple funeral followed by a gravestone of the most ordinary kind in the simplest earthy place. Meanwhile, the Maxwells continued to do research and develop new ideas. Tragically, in 1877, when James Maxwell was working on a new electromagnetism paper, he began to suffer from severe heartburn. He was then diagnosed with stomach cancer. James Clerk Maxwell died on November 5, 1879, when he was just 48 years old. His local doctor ended his medical report on Maxwell by adding, I must say he's one of the best men I've ever met, a sentiment shared by most of the people who knew him. Catherine died seven years later, and little is known of her activities after her husband's death. She has no statue. The same year James Maxwell died, a Maxwellian named Hemholtz offered a prize of 100 ducats for an experiment that would prove, quote, the theory of electrodynamics, which was brought forth by Faraday and was mathematically executed by Mr. Maxwell. Hemholtz asked his 22-year-old grad student, Heinrich Hertz, to attempt it but Hertz was too intimidated. Eight years later, Hertz got a giant spark from one side of the room to create a tiny spark on the other side. How Maxwell and Faraday and Helmholtz inspired Hertz to discover radio waves is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, electricity, electricity.
Electricity, electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a nice thumbs up. If you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend you watch the last one about how Faraday came up with the idea of electromagnetic waves. And also check out the next one whenever I finish it about radio waves. Should be a good one. Okay, have a good day.